This is the first week of Advent, which is exciting. Uh, the Advent season is a, is a beautiful reminder to prepare our hearts as we prepare our homes to celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus. So as each week draws closer, we'll, we'll bring attention to what each week of Advent uh, represents and, and how that relates to Jesus and the cross and the communion table. And the first week of Advent is hope. Hope. Now, hope in Jesus comes from more than just a belief that he was once a baby in a manger, but it's putting our hope as well in Jesus himself. And Jesus will give you hope for eternity. And that's so important. Let's look at 1 John 5, 13. 1 John 5, 13. And it says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. The, the Apostle John here is writing to a group of believers, of Christians, that, that have lost their way. They, they've had a very tough time reconciling some of their, uh, their, their Greek teaching, and, and some of them were falling away from the faith. And because of this, those believers within the church were questioning their faith as well. And, and John, who is Jesus' earthly best friend here, is reminding these Christians of, of who they are. He says, I'm writing this to you guys who are, who are holding on, to those of you that are staying strong, to those who are struggling but, but clinging in there. You can know that you have eternal life, not think that you have eternal life, not wish that you have eternal life, but know that you have eternal life. Jesus came into this world so that they can have that assurance. All that he accomplished in his birth 
and life and death and burial, and most importantly, resurrection, was for that assurance of salvation. So, so John is reminding these believers that in the midst of all they are going through, they should look up and remember that they have hope of a blessed assurance in heaven with God. I remember a day when I had hope. I had a job one time of washing mort tubs. So they were big tubs filled with dead, old, smelly fish. And I used to put uh, Vicks Vapor up under my nose so I didn't have to smell them so bad. And I had to get all geared up from head to toe and use a, a pressure washer that was heated to clean and sanitize these tubs. And that was mainly part of my job. And I'd get covered in the stuff and it was gross. But I kept singing and, and, and whistling away, you know, happy as a clam. I was happily doing my job, listening to my favorite uh, Christian music in my ear, freezing cold. I could barely uh, feel my hands or hold on to the, the pressure washer. And one day in particular, I was singing a little louder than normal and a little happier than normal. And a coworker came up to me and he said, how in the world can you be happy doing a job like that? And, you know, you're always singling, you know, singing and, and whistling away. And I, I said, well, I have hope that tomorrow is going to be better. Now, what he didn't know was that the very next day I was starting my vacation and I was getting ready to fly to sunny, warm Florida in the morning. The hope of a better day tomorrow helped me today. You know, as, as we go through life day to day, we seem to, to go from one extreme to the other. When, when we're going through a difficult time and storms in our lives, our struggles, our, our faith can take a hit. You know, then as, as things are good and, and flowing smoothly along, we tend to be complacent in our walk with Jesus and our faith can take a hit then as well. And when, when our faith is struggling, we tend to forget that we can have assurance in Christ Jesus, assurance of our walk with him, assurance of eternity with him in heaven. Not if, if I check all these boxes, then I might end up in a happy place when I die. No, it's not how that works. You know that a life with Jesus Christ is an eternal life in heaven. And when you're having difficulties and going through a storm, you can hope in the midst of that storm, have hope that eternity is not far away, knowing that Jesus Christ is with you and he'll get you through those difficult times, knowing that you're following him and dedicating your life to him. You know, this life is but a vapor. Knowing eternity with God is waiting, gives us hope in the midst of our struggles. You know, and we know that that hope, knowing eternity with Christ is possible. It's all possible because of what Jesus Christ accomplished. He, he willingly went to the cross, his body broken, his blood shed for you and for me. That's why we gather. That's why we, we take communion, the bread and the juice, which represent his broken body and his shed blood so that we can always remember and never take for granted all that God has done for us. Now at this time, I'm going to pray over these emblems and the emblems of yours at home. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for that hope that you give us in this Christmas season. As a, the first day of Advent is here, Lord, I pray that we would have that hope and cling to the hope that only you can give. Lord, we thank you for Christ on the cross. His body broken, his blood shed for, for us. Lord, I pray that we would never take that for granted. Lord, bless these emblems and the emblems of, of those watching at home, which represent that broken body and shed blood. God, I pray that, that we would always keep that in the forefront of our minds and in the difficult times, remember the hope that we have in you. We thank you for all that you've done and all that you're doing. And we especially thank you for all that you're going to do. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.
A moment can go by so quickly or so slowly. Exactly 15 seconds has passed. That's it. Just 15 seconds. Isn't that amazing? It's it's amazing how long 15 seconds of silence can, can seem, but how short it can be when you're in the hurry or trying to do something or having fun, enjoying something. Do you know that there are 26 days until Christmas? That means approximately 624 hours before we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, or 37,440 minutes to get everything done that you need done before Christmas. There are precious few moments that are left. But I just spent, uh, you know, 15 seconds of that looking at my watch doing nothing. But, but this morning, as we get into the Advent season, the first week of Advent, I, I want to look at, at four parts over the next four weeks, a four-part series on, on the miracles of Christmas. And this morning, I want to talk about the, the miracle of a moment, and we're looking at, at the significance of, of one moment, but also the, the strategic nature of the moments that God gives us and of the timing behind the miracle of Christmas as well. So the first miracle of the moment of Christmas is this. He arrived at the right moment. He arrived at the right moment. Let's look at Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 to 5. And it says, But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. So Jesus arrived into the world at just the right moment. In Galatians, it said, When the set time had fully come. You know, God had planned this from the beginning. All of the, the prophecies throughout the Old Testament told of specific things happening in the world and within governments and geographically. And it all worked perfectly together to bring about the birth of Jesus. Now, God's timing was perfect. And Paul is reminding the Christians in Galatia here that it all happened at the perfect time. At just the right moment in order that Jesus may come into the world to save them from their sins. Jesus arrived at just 
the right moment. You know, the Savior of the world showed up at just the right moment. You know, when I was, I was younger, I had a, a small four-wheeler that I really loved. I drove that thing all over the place. You know, next to our house was a, a, a pond or a small pond that, that used to have water in it. But on this particular day in the fall, it seemed mainly all dried up and, and leaving a nice big flat section of, of mud there, a big mud hole. And it looked perfect and irresistible for me and my four-wheeler. So I got the great idea that I would take my little four-wheeler down in to this perfect mudding hole. And I realized, however, that my little bike probably wouldn't do very well in the mud if I just kind of haphazardly drove straight into it. So me, being very smart, very precisely backed the four-wheeler into the mud and quickly shifted in the first gear and gunned it ahead. Although I didn't move forward at all, I just moved down. And the back tires quickly sunk into the mud. And over the course of probably 15 seconds, I realized to my horror that the bike was sinking and I panicked. I knew dad was going to be home any minute now and I, I desperately didn't want him to see what I had done. So I, I ran and got a shovel and I dug and I dug and I dug but, but nothing helped. I, I ran and got a rope and I tied it uh, around uh, a tree that was there and then to the bike but, but it just kept sinking. I looked at my Spider-Man watch and I knew that, that dad was going to arrive any minute. And I heard a car coming down the road and, and I was ready to face dad and, and face the music. The car pulled into the driveway, but it wasn't dad, it was my brother. I didn't care if he saw my mistakes at all because he had seen many, so I ran over and got him. Um, with his help, we got the bike out of the mud in no time and it was, it was fine. I, I quickly washed all the mud off and I had just finished up when dad rolled into the yard. You know, my brother showed up in that instance at just the perfect time to help me. You know, God's, God's timing in our lives is perfect as well. It, it, it may not seem like that all the time. It may not feel like, like he's listening to you. It may feel like God has forgotten you, but we can be assured that God is working on your behalf behind the scenes all the time. He is lining everything up, opening doors, closing doors, removing obstacles, bringing people into your life, removing other people, and he will move in your life at just the right moment. We must stay strong. We must remain faithful. We must continue to walk the walk in faith and realize and trust that he will arrive at the right moment. Trust that he hasn't forgotten about you. Trust that even though things may not be going how you think they should right now, trust that he will come through at the right moment. He loves you and he has not forgotten about you. So the first miracle of the moment is that Jesus arrived at the right moment. And secondly, that he provides at the right moment. He provides at the right moment. Let's look at a few verses that talk about God's provisions at the right time. Psalm 145, 15 says, The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food at the proper time. Let's look at Psalm 104, 27. Psalm 104, 27. And it says, All creatures look to you to give them their food, at the proper time. Now let's look way over in the New Testament at Romans 5, 6. Romans chapter 5, verse 6. And it says, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. You know, these verses in the Psalms and in a verse here in, in Romans talk about God's provision first with, with food. The Israelites trusted God for necessities like food and shelter and protection and guidance. But then over in Romans, Paul is reminding the church in Rome that God provided for their spiritual needs by, by providing Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice, at just the right moment. When the world was lost to sin, when the Savior was, was needed, when the timing was perfect, God provided. Throughout all scripture, we see that God provides at the right moment. And then the birth of Christ was at the, you know, that's the greatest provision of all. And, and the provisions that would provide a way for the world to be free from the bondages of sin, to provide a way to have a, a weight removed from around their necks. You know, God provided for the world at the right moment. I recently read a story about a, a man of God who, who arrived at just the, the proper time to provide for somebody. And it says, I don't have time for this. 
I muttered to myself, pulling my truck into the overgrown lot on the outskirts of town. I own a small construction company in upstate New York. Friend of a friend had asked if I could do him a favor. An elderly woman uh, had been burned out of her home. She had been living in a little shack out there since May, he said. Christmas is coming. I thought maybe you could help her out. I eyeballed the property. Help her out? There was a rickety old garden shed and the charred remains of a modest house far beyond repair. What am I supposed to do? Build her a new house? Out of that question, I had business to, to do. I had things to do. And the time of year was the worst. Just then, the shed door opened and an elder, elderly woman wearing a bright red scarf and wrapped in a too tight and too light of a coat came out. Instead of warm boots, she wore old sneakers. Mrs. Turek, I said, I'm Craig Grippo. Grippo, she croaked and turned her head. Are you related to Elizabeth Grippo? That's my aunt. Uh, don't tell me you know her. Long ago, she said, we were schoolmates and I taught her to speak English. You see, when Aunt Elizabeth arrived to this country in 1920, she spoke only her native Italian. It must have been tough learning a whole new language. I moved closer. How did your house burn down? I asked. Mrs. Turk lowered her eyes. A, a log rolled out of, out of the fireplace and I couldn't put out the flames. And by the time the fire department arrived, it was too late. The house was gone. I should have left that night, but I couldn't. I've been here almost 60 years. This is my home. The house had been so small, it must have gone up in just minutes. Well, where have you been staying? She, she led me to the shed and two cats slipped out. Oh my, I thought, the musky smell of cats and old wood wafted up. I followed her inside. The dim light showed a space of about the size of a walk-in closet. Pots and pans were scattered on the floor and the center was an old cot covered in afghans. And you know, particle board walls were all that separated her from the cold. I spun around and walked outside. She should not be staying here, I thought. That friend of mine, he must have known I couldn't leave Mrs. Turek like this, but I couldn't build a house by myself. I need a, a, a whole crew. It was almost Christmas. Who had time? Couldn't she just move to a shelter? Suddenly an old saying of my grandmother's, Aunt Elizabeth's mother, came to mind, clear as a church bell. If it's to be, it's up to me. Don't worry, I'll take care of everything, I heard myself tell Mrs. Turk. I loped towards my truck. As I climbed into the cab, I just blurted out, you'll have a new house by Christmas. Am I crazy? Even if I could uh, uh, lean on a few men, where would I find the materials? My eyes fell on the Bible on the passenger seat of my truck. I thought again on my grandmother's words. If it's meant to be, Lord, I prayed, it's up to me. I called everyone I knew in construction, my crew, suppliers, even a competitor or two. I need your help, I told them. I called my customers, told them that I had an emergency and asked for an extension on, on their projects. Within days, 15 men arrived in Mrs. Turek's yard, ready to work. We started pounding nails and raising beams. We agreed to donate our time, but I didn't know how long we could afford to continue. Somehow we're going to make this happen, I kept saying. But even a small house is a big project once you start building. But God provided again and again. Just in time, word spread. The next morning, 20 men showed up, then 30. Then a local TV film crew, Mrs. Turek's story ran on the evening news. That night, my phone lit up. Craig, said the man who explained he was an electrical contractor. What can I do to help? Saw you on TV, another caller said. A plumbing contractor. Anything you need, you got it. I got calls from roofing companies, heating supply companies, carpet suppliers. A, a car dealer offered Mrs. Turek to use a, an RV free of charge until her new house was completed. The frame went up. We, we laid out the rooms. Mrs. Turk threw her old scarf over her head and pulled up a lawn chair and watched uh, over us as her house went up like she was watching a movie. We finished on Christmas Eve. A cozy tan ranch with black shutters, shiny new appliances adorned the kitchen and new furniture filled the whole house. The roofing company gave, uh, roofing company guys even chipped in for some Christmas presents for her. Mrs. Turk stared in disbelief. It's my own little dollhouse, she said, her eyes teary. A few of those tough guys in my crew teared up too, including yours truly. I walked down the driveway to my pickup. I turned and looked at the house, now all lit up for the holiday. I thought of Aunt Elizabeth and of my grandmother's words again. When there, has, when there was something to do, you knew, you knew God wanted you to do. You took the first step and you could trust him with the rest. It was the smallest home I'd ever built, but it gave me the biggest feeling I ever had.
You know, so often we, we, we search for where our provisions will come from. We, we so often worry about how we're going to make it through, both physically and spiritually. This time of year, we worry about Christmas bills and extra expenses. We worry about how we can get through the season. We worry, worry about our health. We worry about our kids and relatives. But God's reminding us to trust Him, to have no fear, to put our faith in Him. And we know that He will provide for our needs at the right moment. Our faith isn't a game. We don't just hope God will provide for us. We can know without fear and trust that He will provide the, the Savior of the world for us. As he did, and at just the right moment, he will provide for you and your needs. And after, you know, and look after you at just the right moments in your life. Sometimes these provisions for us don't always look like we think they should. But when we look back over our lives, we will see that his provision was there time after time at just the right moments. Trust God and know that he provides at the right moment. So the first miracle of the, the moment is that Jesus arrived at the right moment. Secondly, that he provides at the right moment. And thirdly, he says now is the right moment. Now is the right moment. Let's look at what Paul says to the church in Corinth in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. And it says, for he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. You see, Paul is trying to, to boost the church in Corinth, to spur them on in their faith and to walk with Christ. Some of them were, were stalled in their faith. Some of them were, were wanting to follow Christ and accept him as their savior, but were, were scared to really take that step. And Paul's urging them that the time is now. God wants to bless them now. He wants to pour out his favor now. Now is the time to make that decision to follow Christ and surrender to him. You know, Paul can sense that God is on the verge of doing some, some great things in Corinth. But they need to realize now is the moment. So they need to move. They need to take that step. He, he wasn't going to make them do it. But now was the right moment. You know, I often talk to people who say things like, oh, I'll, I'll come to church, you know, one of these days, or one of these days I'll start uh, a Bible reading plan. I really want to get into reading my Bible more. Or one of these days I'll start praying a lot more than I am now. But for many, that, that day never comes. But I'm here to tell you that day should be now. I can sense God wanting to do some, some really great things in people's lives. I, I sense God urging them on in their faith. But so often we wait where we're apprehensive. We're not sure if we, we know that the time is now. We're not sure if God will help us. But God is telling you now is the time. Step out in faith. Trust him more. He will take care of you. You know, purpose in your heart that this Christmas, more than any other Christmas in your entire life, that you will look for and seize opportunities to share the love of Christ. For opportunities to tell people about Jesus and his saving power and his grace. You know, for opportunities to be the hands and feet of Christ and, and help the people around you. you know, that, that, that you will love God and love people more than you ever have before. Now is the time that God wa wants to work in your life in a powerful way. Don't let any more opportunities slip by. Now is the time. You know, in closing, maybe, maybe you've never made that step to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've been... been reluctant to take that step now is that time you know not tomorrow not next year now we're not promised tomorrow he's waiting for you to reach out to him talk to me or another believer that can help you will never ever regret it or maybe you're like me and you've been serving God for a while now but you haven't you know noticed the miracle of of a moment realize today that Jesus arrived at just the right moment in this world and will in your life as well he will provide for you at the right moment, give you opportunities, but you must seize those opportunities. God will never make you do anything. It's up to you. This Christmas season, remember the miracle of a moment. Remember all that God has done for you. Talk to him constantly. Pray continually. Get into his word every single day and never forget that God loves you.